So good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for joining our Malima's Tale Behind the Curtain tote bag. Uh, the voice you're currently hearing, um, I'm Sam, the executive assistant at BATC, and um, I'm also the host. Just a few Zoom guidelines before we get started, which I'm sure you've all heard by now after <laughs> being on Zoom for so long. Um, but if you have a question, you, you have multiple ways that you can um, ask it. We have the Q&A box. Um, we also have the chat box. You can also raise your hand and I will get to you as soon as I can. So we acknowledge that Dallas is on the land of the Keto, Wichita, and Comanche people. Since our activities are shared digitally, let's take a moment to consider the legacy and colonization embedded within the equipment and high-speed internet, which are not available in many indigenous communities. Even the technologies that are essential to much of the art we make leave significant carbon footprints, contributing to changing climates that disproportionately affect indigenous peoples worldwide. We invite you to join us in acknowledging all this as well as our shared responsibility to make good of this time and for each of us to consider our roles in reconciliation and decolonization. We acknowledge that settler colonizers and slavers from Europe used stolen and enforced labor of African people to subsequently develop the land. We honor the lives of all who endured and continue to endure in the face of settler colonialism and white supremacy. Facilitating today's talk back with our creatives is our Executive Artistic Director, Teresa Coleman-Wash. Thank you so much, Sam. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for being here. My name is Teresa Coleman-Wash. I'm the Executive Artistic Director for Bishop Arts Theater Center here in Dallas, Texas. Lynn Nottage is a two-time Pulitzer Prize winning playwright, one for her play Ruin in 2009, and the other for Sweat, in 2017. We are partnering with Profile Theater to bring you the audio play of Malima's Tale by Lynn Nottage. Shout out to artistic director Josh Height and our play director Reginald Douglas who is with us. Reg and I met years ago when we worked on the monologue project in Pittsburgh and New York City. A few months ago, he sent me an email and said, you should take a look at this audio play. I think you, it might be something that resonate with your audience. And so I wanna bring Reg in now and have you guys meet him. Perfect. Uh, the, thank you so much for being here, Reg. I really appreciate I'm you. I'm so amazed by all the Zoom technology, even like a year and a half. <laughs> I know, I know, and I'm delighted that, so you and I have worked together before and we've been trying to find another project to work on. And in this moment, what I love about uh, the way that we're experimenting with technology is that we can work together in yeah. really meaningful ways. I really appreciate you sharing this project with us, uh, Ridge. Go ahead and introduce yourself. Hi everyone, I'm Reg Douglas. I'm the Associate Artistic Director at Studio Theater in DC. Welcome to my living room in this COVID world we're in. Um, I'm a director, as Teresa referenced, I worked in Pittsburgh at City Theater for five years, which feels like yesterday, but also 5,000 years ago after this wild ride we've been on in 2020. Um, one of the great gifts of my time there was you know, yes, working on great new plays and contemporary stories and being able to be a part of the really dynamic arts community there. But I got to just collaborate with really awesome people around the country and those relationships have sustained. And this is a great example of that, you know, that in even with all the distance between us, we can still use art to connect and a shared commitment to using theater to uplift audiences, to build empathy for stories that often go ignored and under under-recognized we share that value and to be able to now collaborate, you know, in this way is just a great gift. So director, producer, and more than anything, just a grateful person. Excellent. Excellent. <laughs> Thank you so much, Josh. I really <clears throat> love having you back on our virtual stage. Um, I saw this play, I saw Malima's Tale, saw the, actually the world premiere at the public theater yeah, in, New York. in New York City. Yes. And so when you called me, when you sent me an email and said, take a look at this, this is something you might be interested in. I was immediately, my, my 
ego was not tied to being the producer. I, we were happy to be, we are happy to be the presenters of this piece because the script is so strong. Can you tell us about the process? I know that the cast members and the audio people were all over. We're the all over. Crew yeah. members were all over the country. Can you tell us about that process? Sure. So Josh from Profile Theater in, in Portland, Oregon, you know, which I've never been to. <laughs> We've <laughs> known each other from we were both working in New York and then during my time in Pittsburgh and now my time here in DC. And we have the same way, looking for a project, looking for a way to keep, you know, deeper, our, deep in our collaboration and work together. And he said, so, you know, obviously we can't work in person right now, but what if you adapted Malima's Tale to audio? And I said, okay, <laughs> that's a great big what if. Right. And, you know, we, we said, I said, yes. And we hired an amazing sound designer, Alicia Bay to who collaborated with the brilliant composer, Jen Mundia, says, I knew the play had to sing. You know, Malima's Tale is a beautiful play that combines poetry and music and theatricality, but it's wonderfully a visual story. You know, you think about Malima's Tale and it's like all the great choreography work and movement work and the way that three actors can become all, all these different characters with just their body. And so what happens if you just use your voice? And so I said, well, I want to use all the parts of voice and what we can give, you know, an audio experience. So yes, having the actors do different dialects and cadence work, but also let's add music, let's add song, let's add composition. And so that was the first step. And then we hired some awesome actors, three of which were in Oregon and they were all in their own homes and their closets and their bedrooms and their bathrooms <laughs> making this work <laughs> under blankets to make sure the sound wouldn't bleed out and no sirens would come in. Alicia Bud, the sound designer in New York City, the engineer, Robbie in New York. Um, Jen was in North Carolina composing over Zoom. She taught all the music over Zoom. Wow. And then we hired uh, who I call my godfather, my theatrical godfather, one of the great actors of our time, stage and screen, Keith Randolph Smith, who was yeah. in his home in New Jersey and in New York. Um, took a break from Broadway to come hang out with us and make this happen. So we were all over the country. We had about, I think, two and a half weeks maybe to put it together, recorded it over, I think about three days or, or three nights. And, 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 you know, and then we had, you know, also the troubleshooting, like, oh wait, we lost your audio in that moment. We lost your <laughs> song in that moment. And so we really pulled it together. Um, I'm just very grateful to all the collaborators because yes, acting and singing and composing are hard enough. And then you say on top of that, add all of this new technology and be your own recording engineer and, find somewhere in your house to tell your kids to go hide. Right, right. To tell the story, you know, and then do it again a different way and do it again a different way. Mm -hmm. And then in post-production, taking pieces of this and piece of this and piece of this and stringing it together to make the final product, so. Excellent, excellent. Whole new, whole new medium, but I would say the medium's different, but the stories are the same and why we tell stories is the same. Yeah, and what I love about Lynn's writing is, um, you know, James Baldwin said the responsibility of the artist is- He's right over there. <laughs> yeah, yes, yes, to reflect He's that. He's always time. on my shoulder. Look and I, I feel like that this script really, really does do that. Can you tell us, tell our listening audience or our, our viewing audience a little bit more about the script? Sure. So Malima's tale follows Malima, an elephant, and we see, we meet him in the wild, uh, remembering and loving and enjoying his family, his friends, Lynn humanizes him. She humanizes the elephant. And then we see him go on the journey to where he ends up as ivory in someone's home. Mm -hmm. And we, I think all know the, the general gist of that journey and how sad and tragic and um, rooted in capitalism and lack of value for life that that commodification of a soul is. Mm -hmm. And Lynn says, I, you know, what we believe she is saying, the metaphor is also for slavery and for how we view Black life in this country, where we also were wild and free and hopeful in Africa and then reduced to commodity and taken across this journey of the world to become property. And what I believe Lynn is saying in that story, as we travel from Africa to uh, press conferences, to museums, to China, to boats and piers, and to someone's apartment building. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. I think what she's taking us on a journey is through history. And she's showing that yes, there is pain in these facts, but there is also resilience. There is spirit, there is soul. And it is what James Baldwin taught us. It is what Toni Morrison taught us that we are yet alive even when the other, when the world makes us feel dead, our spirit is alive. We are still resonating. We are still resilient. We like Malima are still crying out to our ancestors and our next generation that you can run and thrive. And so it was a really exciting script to sink our teeth into because you have all of the specificity of the locations and the snapshots of scenes you know, each of the actors had to take us through. I mean, from Africa to China, to Hong Kong and back, but always sparking through was the joy and the resilience and the spirit. And then adding the score on top of that to really yeah. deepen that emotional response for us. So it's a moving story. It's an honest story. It's mm -hmm. funny because like all life, it we laugh in the midst of pain. Right. And it's a joyful story, I think. Um, and I'm, it's it's always a joy to work in Lenadage's words because she knows how to make the perfect sentence. You know, she always picks the best verb and the juiciest adjectives to make the poetry feel really alive. Yeah. And then these actors just, you know, made it three-dimensional, even though it's just in your ear. And, and what I loved about, what was fascinating to me about the script is there are only four characters. And again, like you mentioned, those four characters play a myriad of- Yeah, um, they play, uh, I think about five each maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's amazing. And we'll see that when we um, go through Janice, our costume designer is here and she's gonna join us and, um, and, and she will uh, go through all of the, um, you know, the different characters that, but I want to, I want to touch on one thing before I let you go. And that is, this is such a visual play. When I saw it at the public theater, you can see how each character was complicit in mm -hmm. the demise of Malima. How did you capture that? You did it so beautifully, but what was your process for capturing yeah. that? During you know, the radio play where so you can see that, yeah. You're so right. It's so vital that we understand that every character is a vital part of his journey and complicit in his journey. And so their presence is always felt. And in the visual production, Lynn tells the director and the actors to use paint. That right. each actor, each actor and character in each scene, when he goes to China, they mark him. And they mark him in Hong Kong. They mark him in the ivory shop. And so I worked with Jen Mundia, our composer, and Alicia, but our sound designer, and said, what if we have Malima's theme? So if it's melody, and after, as each, every time Malima is brought up in a scene or um, a character is talking or disregarding his value mm -hmm. or questioning his worth, that we hear that theme you know, sneak in, that music radiates, and Alicia, but would play with where it comes from. So if you listen, it might be in your left ear, it might be in your right ear. Sometimes it's all over, it's orally, you know, enveloping or encompassing the scene. But the idea was to use music and let the melody grow over time. And so I hope audiences, if you listen closely, you'll hear the pieces of Malima's theme and how they build into this really beautiful kind of act break of sorts where Malima's on the middle passage. Len writes that we are inside the cargo ship with him. And when I read that scene, it right away took me to the slave ships mm -hmm. where you could see and feel the chattel and see people's souls, be, their bodies were chained, but their souls were still crying out and thriving and dreaming is what I believe. Um, these were people who were enslaved, they were not slaves. Right. And Lynn is think, honoring that Malima may have been reduced to an elephant tusk in a box, but his spirit is yet alive. And so in that song, we have a beautiful song called Malima's Tale, was the name of the song. And um, the use of music was our way in. We said, we can't paint you in the audio world. Right. We can show how melody and music and each actor singing is growing their complicity in, um, in this journey and in this story. And you know, I think we're all complicit in the good and the bad mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. we are all part of history. We're all part of the systems, but we also have an opportunity to change history, That's to right. renew history. 
And I think that's what the Lynn's play is doing, Malima's Tale, but also what theater is doing. It's why I thought of you right away as, oh, you might be interested in this idea because I know you believe that that's what art does too. Art allows Absolutely. us to change the culture. That's and right. change the narrative. And so even though the newspaper tells you one part of my story, the history book tells you half of my story, I get to tell you my full truth through my art. And I think that's what Lynn's doing in the play. And what oh my God. To do in the production. That you are absolutely brilliant. I could talk to you all day. Uh, we are, we're out of time oh already. <laughs> I could talk to you all day. Thank you so much. Can you? Thank you. I'm so excited. I wish we could be together in Texas. I know. I know. I got, I got vaccinated gift, you know. so soon. I get my second shot uh, Saturday. I was going to say tomorrow, but Saturday. So, Yay. you know, we're on the other side of this tunnel, I believe. Yes. Yes. Have vaccine, <laughs> we'll check. We'll travel. I believe. Um, can you hang around for a Q&A? Would you be able to? Yeah, I'm now we're going to in, but I'd love for, I know that there are questions for you and I'd love for you to hang around um, for a Q&A if you can. Yeah, until, right. until someone texts me and goes, we'll be in a meeting, I'm okay. ready. <laughs> okay, thank you, Reg, I appreciate you. Thank you. Our next, uh, thank you so much, Miriam, appreciate you. Our next, uh, we're going to bring in Janice Rabian, our costume designer. And Janice has created some renderings uh, for, the, um, for the show. And I'm really excited to have her here. Uh, Janice, thank you so much for being with us. Go ahead and introduce yourself. Hi, thanks for having me, Teresa. Um, my name is Janice Rabian. I am a costume designer. I'm also finishing up my graduate degree in stage design at Southern Methodist University here in Dallas. That's how Teresa and I know each other. And um, I'm hoping to relocate to NYC in the fall. So, you know, vaccinations pending. Hopefully that's the future plan. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, this is your debut on the Bishop Arts Theater Center stage, and we are so delighted to have you. Janice, tell me about, I know that we are going to queue up uh, some of your renderings. I'd love for you to talk about your process as you read the script. And also, I think you contacted the, um, the costume designer from Profile Theater. Tell us what that conversation was and, and how you came about your process. Yes. Um, I mean, the process of designing this play, normally so much of what I do as a costume designer is uh, partnering with everybody in the theater and meeting with the actors and going to these meetings. So it was a totally different process in this pandemic world to work on this play. Um, so you and I did a couple of meetings, which were really helpful in creating the direction of the design. And it always starts with the text. So uh, once I got my hands on Lynn Nottage's script, I read through it a couple of times and took some notes. And as a costume designer, you take really practical notes, like who this person is and what is their job and what is their age and their gender and like identifying basic facts. And then you also uh, start to develop a visual vocabulary. So in this case, I really wanted to uh, create a visual language for Kenya and Tanzania and the countries of Africa and the people of Africa that we were meeting, and then create a separate vocabulary for Vietnam and Beijing and uh, the people of these Asian countries that we were going to meet in the second half of the play. And so you and I looked at some research together and I had initial sketches that we talked through. Um, one of the best conversations was we talked about that white paint that uh, Reg mentioned is yes. Malima marks all of the people who are complicit in ivory trafficking. He, um, he puts a hand on them and that's part of Lynn Nottage's script, but you and I had a great conversation about is every character complicit? Does he mark every single person? Um, and I remember we went back and forth on that a little bit and ultimately I think we decided that yes, every person was complicit in this ivory trafficking. Even if they were trying to prevent it and do something for good, they're a part of that chain. Uh, so that became part of the visual vocabulary of the costume design and became really important. That was like the last crucial step before I could send these images off to you. 
Um, and like you said, I also contacted Dominique Von Hill, who did the costume design for Profile Theaters uh, production. And she and I talked about the script and talked about the process of doing radio play. It's so different for us and our different approaches to it and experiences. Um, and her renderings are still available on Profile Theater's website. So I encourage audience members to go look at her work as well because we took totally different approaches to this play. Yeah. Can we see some of the renderings? Do we have those available? And walk us through. So that looks like. uh, Perfect. There there we go. go. So this is uh, Toy Fan and Angie, and these are uh, two characters who are kind of Malima's first contact in Vietnam when uh, when the ivory gets brought over to Vietnam, it's smuggled into the country. Uh, and these are the first two characters he comes in contact with. Actually, Sam, go ahead and go to the next slide because I think this is kind of a cool conversation. This is Gidi and Raman. They're the two Somali po poachers who we meet uh, in the first few minutes of the play. And these four characters um, I specifically wanted to talk about because they were really difficult to do. You know, I had a conversation really early on that because ivory trafficking is uh, still happening and still something we just don't know a ton about, that we wanted everything to be grounded in fact and reality as much as possible. So my designs are kind of devoid of a fantasy world because this is something that still happens every day. And these four characters specifically were really difficult to research. Um, there's not as much photographic evidence of these people because oftentimes they're not caught and so I had to do a lot of deep diving on the internet. You get some weird results, um, but looking at things like the Vietnamese black market for items that are um, you know, kind of sold off the grid, as well as looking for Somali poachers, which is different than what we think of with Somali and pirates. Uh, and so in some cases I did have to do my own interpretations, but I tried as much as possible to make these people um, real, very real people. Here's the rendering of Malima. Uh, we had a really great conversation early on. The Maasai tribe of Africa is mentioned a uh, couple times really early on in the script. And it's mentioned that the Maasai have um, a spiritual belief about the elephants. And so I drew a lot on the traditional clothing of that tribe for Malima's costume. And to create the vocabulary that he was an elephant did things like changing the texture of the garments and changing, I took away pattern. The Maasai use a lot of really beautiful intricate pattern but I made it really simple and more like elephant hide. Um, but I mimicked their headdress which has these two beautiful curved pieces and it reminded me of elephant tusks. And so we had a really fun conversation about how to translate a human as an elephant visually for an audience. I think we can go to the next one, Sam. Yeah. Githinji is uh, the chief of police uh, for the district of Kenya that they're in. It's on the way to uh, Mombasa. I had to do research on Kenyan police uniforms, which actually changed in 2019 and became this really bright blue that makes them identifiable from any distance. Um, so originally my design, which I think you guys shared on Facebook or Instagram, looks totally different than what I ended up with because everything, I just wanted everything to be really based in fact. So we ended up with this really vibrant blue that, you know, from five miles off, you can see that. Perfect, wonderful. You know, I'm, I'm fascinated by your work. I think that uh, you did an excellent job on really um, giving us a visual of what those characters uh, should look like. You pin a, an essay for HowlRound I think last year that talked about the necessity of pivoting. I'm gonna put that in the chat. And, and Sam, if you can put that on Facebook for the folks that are on Facebook also. And I'm just, so, it's, I'm just so thrilled that you were open to accepting this challenge because as a, you know, a recent graduate uh, of a theater program, <laughs> our industry is so upended. We don't know what's gonna happen, but um, I feel like long after the pandemic is over that we're gonna to have to embrace this new way of um, working and engaging with people. 
And, you know, in my opinion, I feel like it's such an incredible opportunity for us to work with, uh, just to expand our territory. And so Janice, I just, I really appreciate you being here. Do, do you want to say something about that, that essay? Yeah, I would love to. I, this essay is how we met. Um, last summer, I mean, theater shut down entirely and I had to find a different way to move forward. And so I did, uh, I did a fellowship with the Ethics Center on SMU's campus. And my research was on how theaters are kind of adjusting to the pandemic environment that we were in. And so um, you were open to an interview and that's how we got to meet and talk and you're quoted in the article. Uh, and so it's, it's um, that time was really interesting because there was a uh, kind of one side of the coin where these theaters were adjusting to technological changes and moving to Zoom and to things like radio play production, uh, which Dominique Fonthill and I both agreed, this is probably the only time we'll ever get to costume design a radio play production. Um, it's this really unique thing that costume designers never get to do because our whole thing is about the clothes on your body. And so what an amazing opportunity to just get to kind of let our freak flag fly and go for it in this new format. But the article also touched on this other side, which was um, the fact that the theater industry is really behind in terms of uh, integrity and in terms of diversity and equity. It's something that we're constantly um, talking about. And I think the adjustments have been really slow and the pandemic brought that into glaring perspective. And so that's another topic that I hinted at in the article is that we need to be bringing more equity into our conversations. There needs to be more transparency in the way that we operate. We need to be bringing more diverse voices into the room. It can't just be one majority and, and there's gotta be radical change in order to catch up with the message that I think our industry often projects. Um, and so that was something that I know you and I got to talk about quite a bit. And I'm, I'm really glad that that was something that hopefully is going to continue to evolve mm -hmm. moving forward. And I think it's up to not just institutions, but individuals to advocate for that. That's right, that's right. Well, I could talk to you again <laughs> all day and I really appreciate you accepting this challenge. I will tell you that for Bishop Arts Theater Center, radio plays will be around for a long time. I mean, I absolutely love the medium and yeah. I, I love um, that we are experimenting in, in this way and that we are embracing technology again in ways that we haven't. Um, these renderings will be available on our website. So when you, uh, to our listening and viewing audience, when you uh, purchase the play, to listen to, you'll be able to look at the renderings. And I think that there are total, I mean, how many, 20, 30? Oh gosh, I, I think it's about that. The character list was, was extensive. So I think it's about 15 images and about yeah. 30 characters. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So please take advantage of that. Um, thank you so much, Janice. I really appreciate you being here. And if you can hang around for questions. Yes. Q and A. Uh, at about 10 minutes before the, the top of the hour. Great, thanks so much, Teresa. Thank you, Janice, I really appreciate you. So my next guest is Chris Corpus. Chris is with our friends at the Dallas Zoo and he is, I think his official title, he'll, he'll introduce himself, but he handles, he's a conservation manager at the Dallas Zoo. And um, there he is. Chris, thank you so much for being with us. Introduce yourself. Hi, thank you for having me. Yeah, my name is Chris Corpus. My pronouns are he, him. And I am the conservation programs manager at the Dallas Zoo. Uh, so I am the, the lucky guy who gets to oversee and kind of help facilitate some of the many conservation programs that we do um, here in Dallas. Excellent. And well, I have to tell you that I stole an idea. This idea to bring in the Dallas Zoo was, uh, I was following Josh Lead at Profile Theater to bring you guys in, but we have a great relationship with the Dallas Zoo. And, I, and so I was really excited to uh, extend our relationship and have a more meaningful conversation and bring you guys in. I know that your, um, the Dallas Zoo's efforts on animal conservation is, 
is extensive. Actually, I didn't know that before the research, before I started doing research. So Chris, can you tell us exactly what that means? Um, in, in doing research for this piece, I found out for this q and I did find out that the number of elephants have decreased significantly over the last decade and they could be mostly extinct by 2030. An estimated 100 elephants are killed each day by poachers seeking ivory, meat, and body parts, leaving only a few hundred thousand remaining. I'm sure you know these statistics much better than I do. Can you talk a little bit about what you guys are doing? Absolutely, I can. Um, and I, I have a little bit of good news to share uh, after those statistics that you did just share, because while there are around 400,000 or so uh, elephants left in Africa, uh, the number that are being killed each day has dropped since uh, those numbers were published in 2016 of the 100, the 96 or so a day. Um, they're averaging right now about 55 elephants a day. So a lot of the conservation work that's happening in Africa has, um, has started to have some success, though I still have to say there's a lot of work to be done uh, mm -hmm. for us to help save elephants from extinction. I have some slides to share. Would you like me to go into those now yes, and talk please. a little bit about? Yes, let's Sam, get into would you it. mind sharing that? Yeah, uh, and you can go ahead and jump to the second slide there. I, you know, as I was preparing for today, I was thinking a little bit about our human connection with elephants over history, and we have a very long history of elephants as a part of our culture and as part of our art and a part of our religion. Uh, you can see here on uh, the left side, there's a little tile seal that is from the Indus Valley civilization in, in South Asia. Uh, and this tile is, uh, was created around 2500 BC, so several thousand years ago. And then uh, throughout South Asia and Southeast Asia, uh, you have the god Ganesha, who you can see uh, represented in that statue there, that uh, is a very important part of the religious culture uh, in those regions. And uh, something that, you know, it's constantly brought up in the polit political world, in the art world, and just sort of in pop culture, um, both in that part of the world and in our own. If you go to the next slide, Sam, you can see uh, we've got lots of uh, pop culture items that have been created around, around elephants like Dumbo. Uh, we've got uh, Barbar, if you uh, ever read those books as a child, it was originally a French uh, book and then translated into many languages uh, and shared across uh, the world. And then of course, our own political spectrum, we see the, the Republican Party has elephants as, um, as their logo. So elephants, again, just a really important part of our culture. And so then it gives us even more of a reason to think about why should we care about them? Why should we uh, try to protect them? Uh, Sam, go ahead and go to the next slide. I forgot I have one other piece of pop culture to share. One of my favorite books as a kid, Horton Hatches the Egg by Dr. Seuss. Uh, we have lots of colloquialisms uh, in our culture here in the United States about elephants. You've got an elephant's faithful 100% from Horton Hatches the Egg, uh, a common phrase that an elephant never forgets. And then of course, uh, we have white elephant gift exchanges around the holidays very often. Uh, next slide, Sam. But that being said, with all those, you know, with elephants being such a part of our culture, they're still uh, deeply at risk um, despite how much we know of them or we care about them. African savanna elephants, you can see here, we've got that statistic on the right, their population over the last 50 years has declined by 60%. It's a very large number. And in fact, just two weeks ago, the IUCN, which is the group of scientists who determine um, how endangered an animal is, uh, they increased the danger for um, savanna elephants from vulnerable to endangered. And then go to the next slide, Sam, they also, uh, listed the other African elephant species, which is forest elephants, as critically endangered, which is about as high as you can get without becoming extinct. Uh, forest elephants, sadly, over the last 31 years, we've lost about 86% of their population. They are declining at an incredibly rapid rate. Uh, and, you know, you saw the savanna elephants, we had 50 years of knowledge about them, we have 31 years of knowledge about the forest elephants. So there's still a lot of learning for us to do in order to protect them. Uh, next slide, Sam. 
there's a lot of issues facing elephants that we're trying to um, address in conservation. And I think I'll start with the bottom one, that human wildlife conflict. Um, a lot of times I think we think about the people who might be killing elephants as, um, as criminals and as people who are really just don't like animals or just out to make a buck. And that's not always the case. Uh, there are many cases of uh, elephants being killed by farmers who are trying to protect their crops, by um, uh, you know, ranchers who are trying to protect some of the land for their cattle and, and for their uh, livestock that they grow. And so there's this conflict of people who don't necessarily hate elephants, don't necessarily want elephants to be gone. They just want to protect what they have. They need to you know, make sure that they have food for their families, that they uh, can make money to you know, have the housing they need, the education that they need. Um, and so I think it's important to make sure that we don't just paint the picture of people who are involved in, in the hunting and killing of elephants as all villains, because like this play shows, we're all sort of implicit in what's happening in nature around us. We are a part of nature. So whatever we are doing is going to affect nature no matter where we live in the world. Uh, another example of that effect is the habitat loss that you see there. Uh, as more farms are being built, as roads are being built, uh, as cities expand, you obviously then see some of the natural spaces get fragmented, get broken apart and shrink down as well. And thus then we're losing habitat for uh, many animals, including elephants. And that's one of the biggest issues for those forest elephants that we're talking about. Um, they you know, had these huge rainforests that they lived in for centuries. And, um, and now we're seeing those forests dwindling very rapidly all across Western Africa. And so that's something that uh, we at the Dallas Zoo are trying to get involved in. But then there's the big one, poaching, right? That's the one that this play is all about, about the ivory uh, trade. And that is definitely one of the big issues facing elephants. Um, they say that 20% of the elephants killed are killed for um, their tusks and um, not really for the rest of their body parts. Uh, it's just for those tusks, just for that ivory. And there is definitely a criminal syndicate behind that because there's billions of dollars being made uh, on the sale of this ivory. But a lot of times the people who are actually doing the poaching or physically collecting that ivory are often still just those people who are trying to get enough money to feed their families, to get enough money to have housing and then medical care. And so those are the issues that we really need to start to look at and start to focus on if we're going to save elephants socioeconomic issues of the people who live around those elephants. If we can help those people, if we can help increase their access to medical, medical care, increase their access to education, make sure that there's food security, make sure there's housing, all the things that we need right here in Oak Cliff and in Bishop Arts, people also need on the other side of the world. And if we can help in that arena, then we will help save elephants. Uh, next slide, Sam. Um, so what can you do? I think that's the big question that a lot of people you know, when you're facing this issue of an animal on the other side of the planet, of an ecosystem on the other side of the planet, and, and communities of people that you're not directly connected with, how can you help? What can you do? Uh, the first, of course, is don't buy ivory. If we're going to try and save elephants, don't buy ivory, uh, number one. But the other big thing that we've only really started touching with, with the community here in the United States and in, in European countries is that we need to start reporting when we're finding ivory for sale. So in many countries, ivory, um, the sale, the commercial sale of ivory is illegal now. Right here in the US that happened in 20, um, 2016. And so uh, that's been very successful to help slow the sale of ivory, but it hasn't stopped it. You can still find it if you go on Craigslist, you can find it on Facebook in, uh, in market groups, you can find it in Google. Uh, in market groups. And so there's still a lot of access for people to purchase ivory. So what we're now asking people to start doing is to report when they find these websites that are selling, um, selling ivory so that then the officials, we have some amazing people working uh, in our government organizations, both here in the United States and in other countries around the world, but they need to know where these sales are happening. They need, to, they need help finding them. And so there's this website I listed here called End Wildlife Trafficking where you, if you find something while you're online, can just copy and paste that web address and then uh, report it there. And then uh, the officials will try and follow up on that illegal wildlife sale. 
And not just for uh, elephants, uh, you'd also be able to report things like rhino horn or giraffe leather, which is something that is commonly sold here in Texas. So um, it's a really great website to, to bookmark in case you come across anything as you're going through the internet. And then finally, if you're someone who uh, has the available funds, who wants to try to give some sort of direct funding support to the efforts to help the human communities in Africa and help protect uh, the ecosystems and the animals like elephants over there, start to seek out some of the conservation partners and specifically the conservation partners who are working in that socioeconomic um, arena because that's where we're really gonna have the most impact. Let's go to the next slide, Sam. Here's sort of a, a few bullet points examples of what we at the Dallas Zoo are doing as one of those conservation organizations. Um, I have to say like at the top of the list of things we're trying to do in conservation, it's to help people live in harmony with nature. So all of that sort of revolves then again on um, reducing human wildlife uh, conflict and then starting to protect some of the natural spaces around the people and the animals who live there. So we've done that in Tanzania. We've got some partners there where we've um, secured about 365,000 acres of land that elephants and lions and rhinos and many different animals can travel safely through um, that's also being protected by uh, rangers to stop poachers and the local community who lives around those acres are working to uh, make sure that their farms leave space still for the animals to continue to move and eat so uh, we're really proud of the work that's being done there um, and it's definitely one of the most well protected areas for elephant populations in the entirety of africa now uh, we also have partners in botswana who um, when mother elephants are murdered for their tusks, there are often orphaned elephants left behind with the babies. And so uh, we have a partner organization who helps rescue some of those uh, infants and then raise them in the hopes that they can then be re-released back out into nature. We're also really getting focused on forest elephant conservation. So I told you how they're the most at-risk elephant now. Um, we're looking in Western Africa to build a coalition of people and a coalition of uh, different organizations with a wide variety of skills and abilities to uh, combat all of the issues that are being faced there in Western Africa. So we're looking to reduce human wildlife conflict there. We're looking to help um, the educators in that region. We're looking to help the forest rangers and, and the folks who are trying to protect that uh, national park there in Sierra Leone. And then we're also, because there's so little really known about forest elephants in their natural environment, we are uh, participating in some research that's happening there uh, in Sierra Leone. And so we're gonna try and get the first really strong population study done uh, over the next couple of years about the elephants there so we can then identify the best ways to save them. Uh, but there's so many great things happening um, with organizations like ours and several others, uh, partners that we've got that um, we love to celebrate here at the zoo and, and anybody's support of us is directly helping us support that conservation work there in Africa. Uh, next slide, Sam. So there's some contact information if you are curious more about like, who do I look to to try and help with conservation uh, work? And how do I learn more about the elephants? Uh, we've got, we're all over social media, right? We've got Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. We even got a TikTok uh, for the Dallas Zoo. Uh, so you can find us anywhere on there and then uh, there's my social media and email contact in case you have direct questions for me that we don't get to answer uh, in our Q&A today. I think that conservation is, um, let me start that over again. A lot of people think that conservation is a biological science, that it's about researchers going out into the field and studying the life history of an animal. And that is definitely a part of conservation work. But I view conservation as a social science. It needs to be the intersection of many skills and many um, different industries and many different uh, types of work being done in order to solve the problems because all the problems in conservation are stemming from people problems. And if we can resolve those people problems, then we can uh, protect that nature that we all are a part of. And I love that this um, play is a great example of that because you know, we've got uh, a cross section of people from across the country here that are performing just this specific play, right? From Oregon, from New Jersey, from New York, from here in Dallas. Uh, that is a great example of an intersection of many people in different places coming together for one 
a great cause. And then just the awareness, I think that can come out of a play like this to help open people's eyes to the poaching conflict and the human side of the poaching conflict um, will help us make some real change. So thank you for letting me share about that. And I am excited to, to be here. Yeah, this is fascinating. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you sharing all of that. And um, if you guys have questions, please put them in the chat. If you're on Facebook, Sam, if you can um, flag those questions. I want to bring Janice back in. We're, we're almost at time. We have about 10 minutes. But Chris, I wanted to, um, you know, in my research for this Q&A, I also... I watched several documentaries. And one of the documentaries was around circus events. I don't think I'll ever go to a circus and um, see elephants the same way. Um, what would you say to critics who, would, who say that elephants should be in their nat natural habitat? Hmm. It's a great question. I think, uh, you know, of course, the natural habitat is the best place for all of us to be, whether we are people or we are animals. Uh, nature is, is ideal. I think there are a lot of ways that you can still have animals in a habitat that's um, human maintained, like a zoo or an aquarium, where you can still fulfill the needs of uh, those animals and provide um, both the, the mental engagement that they need, the the physical engagement that they need and have them then be a representation to help people learn about a species and be able to um, you know be inspired to want to do something to protect them. Uh, we actually had an interesting study that we did with the elephants at our exhibit here at the zoo uh, where we had some Fitbits created and they went around um, one of the legs of the elephant and we would track them and their movements around uh, our exhibit and you know, you think about elephants who can travel many miles um, across their natural habitats in Africa. And we had similar things happening here. We were able to track that they were um, traveling up to seven to 10 miles a day. And so uh, just within the exhibit, getting to move around, play with each other, eat food. Um, uh, there's often like different things we call enrichment that our, an our animal care team puts into an exhibit so that the animals have something to play with, something to stimulate their minds. Uh, and so they would be doing that all across and getting a very similar amount of movement in space that they might have, or similar amount of movement in what some might consider a smaller space, but still, I would say, plenty of space uh, for an animal to be fulfilled. Interesting, that's, that's really interesting. And I have a question here. Um, how did you come into this work? What's your background? My background? My background is, has been uh, a, a long and winding path. So I, I started in uh, journalism. At the beginning of my career was in that. And then moved into, I moved to Los Angeles and started working uh, in film and television. And, uh, and then started looping back sort of into that journalism and documentary storytelling. Uh, I worked at the public aquarium in Los Angeles called the Aquarium of the Pacific, where I oversaw our documentary filmmaking program. And uh, as I was doing that, I also went back to school and got my master's in conservation biology and sort of the, the congruence of those skills helped lead me to Dallas, where uh, I now get to work with so many different animals and tell stories of, of conservation work around the world here. Excellent. Excellent. Same question for you, Janice. How did you come into this work? Oh gosh, um, I came to costume design through acting because I was super dramatic as a kid, and my parents were like, "We can't have that in the house." Like, so they had me audition for local plays, and I just really fell in love with theater and and that storytelling medium. And as I got older, I kind of realized that I. Uh, didn't want to be the next Angela Lansbury, nor was that kind of what my heart was after. And so I ended up transitioning into costume design and have been designing for the past five years. Excellent. Are there questions on Facebook? Please guys, don't be shy. We'd love to um, take advantage of the expertise that is, that's here in the, in the room. Um, so Chris, um, you, you said early on, 
in a preliminary conversation that all of our issues facing animals are people issues. And I'm so glad that you mentioned the socioeconomic um, challenges that we're facing. Can you tease that out more? What are, what are the misconceptions? What are we missing? Uh, when you say misconceptions, what do you mean? Like are misconceptions about uh, the African uh, communities or? Uh, I think misconceptions, you mentioned that, um, so elephant poaching is not just about um, people who want ivory, but also folks who are just trying to, trying to make a living, mm -hmm. trying to, um, and, and you're closer to that more than, than, than most of us are. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Sure. I mean, I would say, you know, not just with elephants, but with all poaching uh, around the world, while there is a larger syndicate behind the big things like ivory, um, rhino horn, um, a, an animal called the totuaba in Mexico um, mm -hmm. being killed for their body parts, the people that are doing it are, are really they're gonna go the route that's the easiest to make enough money to take care of their families. Um, you know, the, when we think about, uh, there's another animal that I'm gonna to refer to now called the vaquita, which is the most endangered marine mammal in the world. It's a small porpoise that lives, uh, there's about nine of them left in uh, the world living in the Gulf of California in Mexico. And the fishermen who live there uh, don't hate the vaquita, but uh, they are struggling in their fishing community to be able to uh, fish for the shrimp and the other animals that they need to catch to sell, to have the money to buy you know, a house, to buy food, to make right. sure their kids can go to school. All those same things that you and I want for ourselves and for our families um, is what those people want too. And if it's, if it's harder to make money doing legal routes than it is to do Ill illegal routes, then some people are gonna go that illegal route just because that's the fastest way to make sure they can take care of their families. Right, we see that yeah. with like the gold mining trade. We see that with um, uh, the mining for other minerals in Africa, like coltan, it's um, threatening gorillas and all sorts of species. Um, and it's really not about these people who have an agenda against the animals and agenda against nature. They're just trying to make a living. So They're we need to help to them. Yeah, yeah, we need to help them make a living in a different way uh, and have opportunity that they don't have to then um, overuse our natural resources. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's always a story behind the story, right? Yeah, yeah. Really is. Janice, we, I'm sorry. yeah, Janice, we have a question from you, for you from Yvonne. And she says, how do you go about, I guess, uh, she says, doing your renderings. How do? What's the process for for creating your renderings? I guess that's the question. I hope that's uh, right, Yvonne. The costume renderings or illustrations that I did for this project, uh, I predominantly used Adobe Photoshop, um, and the reason being is that I could change things as I go along. So you have the ability to change color. You can add in. Um, you can bring in other images. So I brought in all of that research that we talked about so that it was right there in the same file. And I could look exactly at the Kenyan chief of police's uniform as I was getting those badges and decorations onto Githinji. Um, so step-by-step step through the process is getting a, a reference figure that's either close to the actors who are voicing these characters or just a good reference to give a different idea of uh, an imaginary person's disposition or figure. And then it's just dropping clothes onto those bodies. That's what my mentor always says. Is she's like, we just have to get the body and then you drop clothes onto it. <laughs> um, and then I start to paint with Photoshop and using all those different tools. And then once we start to have conversations, I can tweak color and I can bring in um, other images. In certain cases with the authorities in Vietnam, I just took an image of their actual badge and brought it into the image so that that was accurately represented and I wasn't faking the symbols and language on those badges. Um, and so, yeah, it's a, it's a lot of painting in a digital medium. You spend a lot of time staring at a screen. Uh, so those blue light glasses come in handy. <laughs> <laughs> 
And, and costume designing really is about research also. It's, it's a lot of research. Yeah, so. yeah, you do a lot of, um, well, it's interesting because other designers also are of the mind that like you do the research so then you can uh, ignore the research or change what you learned from it. So it's kind of like you learn the rules to break the rules. Interesting. Um, yeah, so with Malima's Tale, we both agreed that we wanted it to be accurate to what Chris was talking about, that these are just everyday people trying to provide for their families. They're not, they don't hate elephants. Um, so a lot of my process for this play was doing research so I could be as accurate as possible to represent these people who are just like you and me and the rest of us. But on other projects, um, I've worked on things that are high fantasy where I'll do a lot of really specific research and then just take certain pieces of it and really manipulate it and twist it so I can do something totally different. Well, thank you so much for that insight. That, this is fascinating. This has, been, this has been such a great conversation. I really appreciate all of you being here. Thank you so much for participating in uh, this behind the curtains Q&A for our production of Malima's Tale. I encourage all of you who are listening and watching to please, please do yourself a favor and um, take some time to listen to Malima's Tale and Nottage. It is an amazing piece. You will be enlightened, you will be entertained to Reg, Reg's point. There's comedy of, in every great theatrical uh, event. There's, there's a little bit of everything. And I think that you'll find that here in the script. Thank you so much for being with us. We really appreciate it. You can visit our website, bishopartstheater.org and, um, and look us up, click on tickets and you will see the audio play of Malima's Tale by Lynn Nottage. Thank you so much. And please remember that Janice's renderings, the costume design renderings will be made available on our website as well. Thank you so much.